Chapter 11, A Sad Farewell and Crucial Moves Lord Melbourne made a quick step to the room where Victoria was, and when he came in he saw Victoria weeping in the arms of her personal maid. What is it, Victoria? asked Lord Melbourne, bewildered and worried. Both Scarrett and Victoria were startled when they heard him, and Miss Scarrett hastened to ask Victoria for permission to retire, and when Victoria barely nodded, Scarrett left the room, closing the door to give Victoria and Lord Melbourne privacy. Lord M., why did not you tell me? Victoria said weeping and pouting. Tell you what, Victoria? Asked Lord Melbourne distressed. The horrible women who harass you. Cried Victoria, raising her voice. Lord Melbourne was speechless, and even more confused. Why did not you tell me that shameless women approach you on the street in an indecent way? Why do I find out for other people? Victoria said excitedly and nervously, still crying. Victoria, it's all just nonsense of foolish and frivolous women. It's not something so it's worth wasting your time, Lord Melbourne replied, a little nervous but trying to ease his tension and sketch out a friendly smile. No. Lord M. For me it is quite serious, for me it is humiliating and very mortifying. And what about your underpants that one of your maids sold? And the drawers sent you these indecent women? Cried Victoria, furious and hurt. Lord Melbourne was shocked, then he felt like laughing, but seeing the expression of rage and anguish on Victoria's face, he thought it was a bad idea and tried hard to make a pitiful and serious gesture on his face. Victoria, you know what people are like, a disloyal maid wanted to take advantage of the situation to earn money, but my butler acted quickly and efficiently and fired her. He also fired the other employee who sold that information to the tabloids, it's all the fault of that stupid and ridiculous chronicle of that foolish journalist. I am the one who feels the most uncomfortable and annoyed with this situation, you know me Victoria, and you know that I am not a vain and ridiculously frivolous man. I am a man who only wanted to have peace and tranquility, but this is our life Victoria, and is the price we have to pay for it. Please Victoria, do not be tormented by that, said Lord Melbourne reassuringly. How can I not torment myself, Lord M? How can I do it if all the women of England desire you and love you for them? said Victoria pouting like a little girl. Lord Melbourne could not help but smile, and at heart he was amused and moved by Victoria's anguish, and he was also a little satisfied, seeing that she was jealous for him. Victoria, come here, sit with me, please, said Lord Melbourne, pointing to a sofa. Victoria came over and sat down on the couch, and he sat down beside her. Victoria, none of those women interest me. I'm not interested them because the only woman I care about is sitting next to me, said Lord Melbourne, taking Victoria's hands and squeezing them between his. Lord M. Victoria replied with excitement and her eyes still filled with tears. Do you remember that occasion when you were tormented and depressed by your error with Lady Flora Hastings and the consequences of that? You did not feel the mood to continue and I sat next to you and I tried to comfort you and give you courage to resume your duties. I told you about my son, how I had lost the will to live after his death and how you you had returned me that desire to live. But at that time I would have wanted to do something that I could not do out of respect, because you were the queen and I your subject, but now that I am your fiancé, I think I can take that liberty, said Lord Melbourne very friendly and with a sweet smile. Victoria was thrilled and her heart quickened because she thought he was going to kiss her on the lips. Lord Melbourne put his arm around her back and drew his body close to Victoria, and she closed her eyes waiting for a kiss. But what Lord Melbourne did was draw her to him and make her rest her head on his chest. He put one of his big hands on Victoria's head and stroked her, as he pressed her head to his chest. Victoria could hear his heartbeat. When I was a little boy and was very distressed for any reason, my mother took me and made me lay my head on her chest, she told me that as a little girl she watched as the animals comforted each other by lying down on top of their fellows. She saw it in cats and dogs, and horses. Then my mother said that we humans have a lot to learn from animals, 
and that there was nothing better for a tormented soul than to lay your head on the chest of someone who loves you and then lull you the beats of its heart and the rhythm of its breath, while you breathe yourself. Breathe Victoria, breathe, serene your soul, serene your heart, said Lord Melbourne in affectionate tone, while caressing her head over her hair. Victoria closed her eyes again and wept silently. Victoria, my love, you must calm down, in your situation you do not need so much tension, just rest in my chest and allow my heart lull you. That's my love, that's it. Whispered Lord Melbourne in a soothing and affectionate voice, and then kissed Victoria's head over her hair. Victoria let the breathing and heartbeats of Lord Melbourne soothe her, like a lullaby. The movement of Lord Melbourne's breast also contributed to plunging her into a state of relaxation and even drowsiness. After a few minutes, Victoria was quiet. Are you calm, Victoria? Lord Melbourne asked quietly. Yes, thank you, Lord M., Victoria said, pulling her head away to meet his eyes. You always have the right way to calm me down. Victoria, you must be calm. I am very concerned about your peace and well-being. Especially now. Said Lord Melbourne and then he put his hand on Victoria's belly and caressed it, surprising Victoria and making her smile with timidity, the nerves are not good in your current situation. In any case, you should not worry about nonsense, you are a queen, and you must accept that people will do stupid things often that may dislike you, but you must be above that. And you must know that I will never do anything to hurt or embarrass you deliberately, he added. I know, William, but. I cannot help feeling angry when these women send you their drawers or buy your used underpants. I know I'm a fool, but I'm mortified. Victoria blushed and with some sadness. Lord Melbourne saw her so desolate and he was so moved by her insecurity, and deep down he felt so satisfied because she jealous him of other women that he could not help it. He took Victoria's face in his hands and came and he kissed her lips. It was a sweet kiss but with a certain passion, rubbing his lips over hers, prolonging the kiss for a couple of minutes. When Lord Melbourne broke the kiss and pulled away, he saw the amused gesture on Victoria's face, with her eyes closed, then saw her open her eyes and sketch out a sweet, cheerful smile. Do you see Victoria? You have nothing to worry about because all those women must be envious of you, you have the god of the chronicle for yourself, said Lord Melbourne mockingly. They both laughed. Besides Victoria, you have to see the good side of things. If at any time Her Majesty's treasury is in crisis, we can solve it by selling Her Majesty's consort's underpants, Lord Melbourne joked. Fool! Victoria replied giving him a soft punch in the chest, while she laughed the next woman buy your underpants or send you her drawers I will send her to the Tower of London. She added mockingly. You must send all the women of England to jail. Exclaimed Lord Melbourne mockingly. Good thing you're not vain, Lord Melbourne. Victoria replied laughing, with sarcasm. Lord Melbourne laughed, and after laughing for a while, Victoria stared at him with a sweet expression. How long have we not laughed like this? Lord M. Victoria asked with some emotion. A lot, unfortunately. I missed you too, Victoria, Lord Melbourne said with sincerity and a certain sadness. You never talk about your mother, today you did, and I was touched, Victoria said softly. Yes, I know, is that the memory of my mother I treasure it inside my heart and it is something very intimate for me. I do not usually speak of her with almost nobody, except with the few people who are close to me and who knew her and I know they loved her too, like my friend Lord George. But I want to share my memories of her with you, from now on. I want you to know her through me. Lord Melbourne responded with emotion. I'd love to meet my mother-in-law through you, William, Victoria said charmingly, squeezing her hand. Speaking of mothers. I think your two mothers are offended, Lord Melbourne commented with a wry, amused smile. Yes, I know. I really disrespected my mother and Lazen, Victoria admitted like a child who grudgingly acknowledges that she has done something wrong and must apologize for it. 
now I will have to beg for the forgiveness of those two stiff and hard Teutonic ladies. Some time later Victoria, Lord Melbourne, the Duchess, Lazen, Emma and Harriet had lunch together in the palace. I've never been so pleased with your presence, Lord Melbourne, you have a gift to appease even the most ferocious monster, the Duchess remarked wryly. Mama, I already asked your pardon. I begged for your forgiveness and for Lazen's, and I promised that I would not do it again. I need not be that reminded of my fault. Victoria told her annoyed mother. Do not worry, Dina. In any case soon I hope we have Lord Melbourne living with us so that he can calm you down. Have dinner with us tonight, Lord Melbourne. Asked the Duchess kindly. I'm afraid I cannot do it, Your Highness, said Lord Melbourne kindly. Why not? Victoria asked, surprised and disappointed. It's just that my friend, Lord George, has organized a meeting tonight at his house, a meeting with Tories members of Parliament, some of whom have opposed our wedding. He wants me to meet with them, and they listen to me. He thinks this meeting can be very important to speed up the process and advance our wedding, Lord Melbourne said. And you think it's possible? Victoria asked excitedly, her eyes bright. Maybe. I do not want to be optimistic or pessimistic. I prefer to be realistic. Some of them are very obsessed in their opposition to our wedding, although I am also hopeful, for the favorable change in public opinion. George was right, most people are leaning in favor of our wedding and the criticism of the press is dwindling, and support is growing. Many of the opposing, members of parliament are reconsidering their position because of the pressure of their constituents. I hope George is right and my direct dialogue with the most reluctant can dispel his fears and objections. I hope everything goes well tonight, said Lord Melbourne wisely. Later, Victoria was saying goodbye to Lord Melbourne. I wish you well, William, Victoria said sweetly and enthusiastically. I'm going to need it, Victoria. Tonight, being surrounded by Tories, I'm going to feel like Julius Caesar on the Ides of March. Lord Melbourne said mockingly. I do not think the Tories are so bloody, Lord M., Victoria replied with a smile. I would not trust, ma'am, Lord Melbourne said with a wry smile, then lifted Victoria's chin with his fingers in a loving gesture. And remember Victoria, you must not be distressed by anything, and you must trust that I will do whatever is necessary for you to be happy and calm, he added, then lowered his head and kissed her sweetly on the lips. I know, Lord M. I'm looking forward to the day when I'm your wife, Victoria said with bright eyes. Me too, Victoria, me, too, Lord Melbourne answered affectionately. That night George was talking to his Tories guests at his house, waiting for the arrival of Lord Melbourne, and at one point he went into a corner with a young member of Parliament, whose name was Benjamin Disraeli. I'm sure that when you know Lord Melbourne better, you will realize that there is no better consort for our queen, George said, continuing a conversation that had already spread for several minutes. I understand that is your opinion, Lord George, because you are a good friend of Lord Melbourne, and your defense of him honors you. And do not think that I despise your arguments, them are very legitimate and convincing. But you will also understand my arguments to oppose that marriage and to refuse to support the legal changes necessary to facilitate it. I do not think it would be beneficial for the country that our Queen marry a former Prime Minister who comes from the ranks of a political party, putting at risk the image of neutrality of the Crown in the country's politics, Disraeli said. Well, you know that I am Tory, and though William has been Whig, I think above all else he is a patriot who has always advised the Queen to be impartial between the political parties. In any case I expect you to check it in person, because I consider you a very intelligent and reasonable man of state. So much so that I'm considering making an economic donation to your election campaign for the next general election, George replied with a smile. I do not want to offend you with what I'm going to say but I want to think that your donation is not a way to buy my vote to support the wedding in Parliament," Disraeli said with a smile that was meant to be kind but was rather sarcastic. I would never think that you are a man to be bought with money, Mr. Disraeli, I consider you a man of principle, 
George replied with a sarcastic and cunning smile. At that moment George's butler announced the arrival of Lord Melbourne. The evening, was spent in a relaxed mood, in which Lord Melbourne with charm, cunning, and patience faced the doubts and criticisms of the Tories attending the meeting, and managed to cordialise them. Lord Melbourne responded to Disraeli's frequent interventions, and despite the petulance of the young conservative politician and his critical stance, Lord Melbourne never lost his kindness to him and intelligently managed to refute his objections without clearly confronting him. At the end of the evening, Lord Melbourne and Disraeli were face to face, at the time of farewell. Mr. Disraeli, I am only a man who wishes to serve his queen, who by the whim of fate is also the woman I love. I have no other aspirations in life to live to support her, always in the background, always understanding that the queen is she and she is the one who must reign, in a way, you could say that I am like one of the characters of your romantic novels, for example, your novel Henrietta Temple. Said Lord Melbourne. Have you read my novel Henrietta Temple? Disraeli asked surprised and a little skeptical. Of course, and in a way, I identify with Ferdinand Armine a little. The relationship between the Queen and me must face an opposition a little like the one that had to face the relationship of Ferdinand and Henrietta. It is assumed that Ferdinand and Henrietta were not destined for each other, and that for the welfare of both and their respective families they should never marry. But you arranged things brilliantly so that both of them had a happy ending, Lord Melbourne replied with apparent enthusiasm. Well. I must confess that I am a little flattered, Lord Melbourne. I never thought you would be among the admirers of my literary work, Disraeli replied truthfully. It's a good book, Mr. Disraeli, do you want to hear why I love the woman and I adore the queen? Said Lord Melbourne and seeing that Disraeli nodded, continued because her embodies the greatness of our great nation and the British people, she has the courage, the passion, the ambition, the greatness and the dignity of our people, its ability to dream and its vision of the future, the qualities that have made our country the most powerful and prosperous on earth, and the metropolis of the greatest empire in history, she has our qualities multiplied by a thousand, and she also has our defects, because in order to be the perfect incarnation of our national soul it have also to incarnate our defects. But she has the will to overcome her defects and to fulfill her duty with devotion. I am convinced that she is the best monarch we could have in these difficult times, because she will hold us together in the face of adversity, she will give us the courage to fight for a future full of glory, she will keep alive the flame of hope in one life better for all, and she will make us continue safe from revolutions, anarchy, and tyranny. The continent is covered with disorders and it will not be many years before the revolutions bathing with blood to Europe once again, and in large part because the European monarchies are incapable of renewal and most European monarchs do not realize that we no longer live in the time before the French Revolution, when the people lived to serve their monarchs, now monarchs are the who must live to serve their people if they do want to survive. It is something that the King of Hanover, the ineffable Duke of Cumberland, does not understand, for example, but Queen Victoria perfectly understands and preaches by example. The greatest success of my life is to have guided the Queen so that she would find her own way and discover the purpose of her mission in life. I am proud of the Queen in which she has become and believe me that the last thing I want is to ruin her success, because her failure would also be my failure. I just want to live to give her the domestic happiness and stability she deserves, to build a family together and serve as an example to all the families of the country. I do not want or accept another prerogative or privilege other than those of a husband with respect to his wife, even less than that, since as husband of the Queen I must accept that she will be the real head of the family and not me. But like Ferdinand, I will feel happy to live next to my Henrietta, said Lord Melbourne with sincerity and conviction. You are very passionate and convincing, Lord Melbourne, now I understand your speech before the Privy Council. But you must admit that it is legitimate to feel misgivings when you are a politician, and also a Whig politician, which for me as a Tory is not very encouraging, Disraeli replied sincerely but kindly. I was a politician, it is true, Mr. Disraeli, and I have also been Whig, but that can be an advantage. I am an English politician, an English aristocrat, but I am not of royalty, 
I am a simple Viscount. That implies that I do not have the backing of a royal dynasty, not even a small, or a foreign nation, my only endorsement is the Queen, who is no small thing, but thanks to our sacred constitution she has in front the barriers of government, parliament, justice and public opinion, of a free people. No, Mr. Disraeli, I am no problem to anyone. It would be far worse for the Queen to marry a foreign prince which would engage England in uncomfortable and disadvantageous alliances with kingdoms or principalities of the continent, who demand our support and our money for little or nothing, replied Lord Melbourne. You are very good at arguing, Lord Melbourne. No wonder you has become Prime Minister. Disraeli answered truthfully but with a touch of humour. As I am sure you will become, said Lord Melbourne. Do you think I'll be Prime Minister? Disraeli asked in amazement. I have followed your career, Mr. Disraeli, and I am sure you will be Prime Minister. Within five, ten, or fifteen years. I do not know when it will happen, but I'm sure it will happen. Perhaps, I will not be among the living by then, I do not know, but I hope that the Queen Victoria will continue as Queen by then. And if you allow me to give you an advice, Mr. Disraeli, Although it is true that according to our constitution it is not necessary for a prime minister to have the support of the monarch, and that a monarch does not need the sympathy of its prime minister, the best for both and for the whole country is that both have a good relationship. And Queen Victoria never forgets the favours, she is very grateful and gives her unconditional friendship to those who help her at crucial times, and her friendship is very valuable to a prime minister, she really has a good memory, for good and for bad. Lord Melbourne answered with a meaningful look. I think I understand you, Lord Melbourne, Disraeli replied with another meaningful look. Saying goodbye to George and Lord Melbourne, Disraeli saw both intensely. Thank you for the evening, gentlemen, you two have given me much to think about, said Disraeli. After he left, Lord Melbourne and George spoke among them. Thank you for telling me that summary of the novel, said Lord Melbourne. Thank Eleanor, she was the one who read it and summarized it to me, George replied. The next day Lord Melbourne came to say goodbye to Catherine in the house he had rented for her. Thank you, Lord Melbourne, for everything, Catherine said, tears streaming down her cheeks. It's the least I can do for you, you've been a great friend to me. You will never have to sell your body again. I will help you so that you can educate yourself to have a good job or I will finance you so that you can have your own business, a good legal business, maybe a ladies' clothing store, or whatever you prefer. The truth is that I will make sure that your son and you have the life, you too deserve, said Lord Melbourne affectionate and kind. Thank you Lord Melbourne, thank you. Cried Catherine as she approached him, hugged him, and kissed him on the lips. Catherine, we can not said Lord Melbourne slowly parted his lips as he stroked her face. We must be friends, good friends, but not lovers. Lord Melbourne, you would not be the first married man to have a mistress, Catherine said anxiously, almost like a desperate plea. Catherine, I want to be a faithful husband to my wife in every way. After I marry, I will not have any woman who is not my wife. I do it for her, for Victoria but also for myself, and for duty. I will never commit adultery, it is a firm decision. But you do not deserve it too, Catherine, you deserve something much better than being the mistress of a married man, you deserve to have a man who loves you, to consecrate himself exclusively to you, you deserve to be a wife and not a mistress, said Lord Melbourne tenderly. What man could marry me? A stained woman, indecent, dirty. Catherine replied in pain. Do not say that. You are much purer and more decent than many women of the aristocracy I have known. You did not prostitutes yourself, for pleasure or choice, you did it out of necessity. On the contrary, there are many women who presume to be decent are terribly immoral, with even depraved behavior. You have the right to love and you have the right to be loved as any woman, you will surely find a man who makes you happy and loves you without terms. If I had known you in another life, in other circumstances, I could have been happy with you and I would not have cared for your past, 
but for better or for worse, my heart belongs to her, she deserves it or not, and there is nothing that I can do against that, said Lord Melbourne with a mixture of sadness and compassion. I understand, it's the story of my life, whenever I find a good man, his heart has a owner. But your fidelity to her honours you. But I beg you to make me happy one last time. I beg you to make love to me last time before your wedding, pleaded Catherine. No, Catherine, we must not. Said Lord Melbourne somewhat distressed. Please Lord Melbourne. You has not yet married, you still does not owe allegiance her, please give me that last satisfaction, that last goodbye, before giving up your body and your caresses forever. Lord Melbourne saw the pain in Catherine's face, the pain of a broken heart, a pain he had suffered many times in his life. And he did not have the courage to refuse. They went up to the bedroom and helped each other to remove their clothes, very slowly. When they were all naked, they lay on the bed, and Lord Melbourne kissed and stroked her whole body, and stimulated her with his mouth and his hands. When he penetrated her, she clung to him trembling and gave him a deep kiss on the lips. Unlike their first intimate encounter, this time they made love slowly and softly, with tenderness but without leaving the passion. When they reached the climax, Catherine wept in his arms and he comforted her with tender caresses and kisses. But time went on, and a pair of days later a decisive vote was held in the House of Commons of Parliament. George watched from the gallery anxiously as the Speaker of the House granted Disraeli the right of speech in the pre-ballot debate. Gentlemen, I have meditated a great deal these days on the question of our Queen's planned wedding with Lord Melbourne, and I have contrasted my initial convictions on the subject with the facts, and the reflections of people whose opinion deserves all my respect. I have carefully weighed the points for and against this marriage link, and I must admit that my initial prejudices have been strongly shaken. That is why gentlemen, I have decided that the best thing for the well-being of this country and our beloved Queen, is to unconditionally support her marriage with the distinguished Lord Melbourne, Disraeli said in a loud and clear voice, solemnly. Yes. George exclaimed excitedly, causing some spectators at his side to turn to him with reproach, and he apologised for his breach of protocol and good manners. There was a great scandal in the house when one of the most critical voices with the wedding changed sides, there was applause from Whigs and Tories who already supported the marriage, and some boos and angry voices among those who still opposed, basically a minority but significant part of the Tories and very few Whigs. There was bewilderment in others, who now doubted their initial opposition. When the crucial vote came, a sweeping majority of Tories and Whigs approved all the necessary points for the wedding to take place. George came out of Parliament almost mad and rode on his horse as fast as he could to get to Dover House, and when he arrived he dismounted so abruptly that he almost fell to the ground, and then dashed to the mansion. He found Lord Melbourne in the library, and upon seeing him Lord Melbourne blanched expecting terrible news. But George gave a huge smile and opened his arms. We did it. A crushing majority of the two parties approved all the points, you can marry the Queen cried George. Lord Melbourne was astonished, then he smiled and his eyes filled with tears, and he stepped forward to shake hands with George, but in the end both ended up hugging each other like brothers, excited. Meanwhile at Buckingham Palace, Victoria waited tense and resigned, because Prime Minister Peel had warned her that it was most likely that the vote would be held the next day by the donatious opposition and the delaying tactics of the critics with the wedding. She walked with Lazen, Emma, and Harriet for a room, in the direction of another when a servant announced the arrival of Peel. The Prime Minister knelt and kissed Victoria's hand, without the grace of Lord Melbourne, and then stood up. Ma'am, I bring you some very important news that you must know immediately, Robert Peel said earnestly. Victoria feared the worst and her face went pale, and she felt a little dizziness, but Emma and Lazen hurried to take her, one of each arm. Are you all right, ma'am? If you want we can. Said Peel worried. No, I'm fine, please, Sir Robert, do not make me wait any longer. Tell me what you should tell me, whatever, Victoria said anxiously. Ma'am, it is my duty to inform you, 
that the House has voted and by a large majority, has approved each and every one of the points. Ma'am, you can get married when you wish with Lord Melbourne, Peel replied solemnly, smiling at the end. Victoria opened her eyes, her face covered with surprise, and then she began to cry in a nervous way, almost hysterical, as a relief to so many days of uncertainty and fear. Her tears shocked them all, including Peel who felt uncomfortable but also tender, without being able to avoid it, Victoria took Lazen's hand and drew the woman she saw as her true mother. And then she embraced the Baroness, while she wept compulsively, and the Baroness stroked her back, forgetting the others present, and thinking only of protecting her little girl.